The following message is brought to you by your friends at Journey Life Church. Want to connect? Find us on Facebook or join us Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. at Hatton Community Learning Center here in Akron. Let's start with prayer. Father God, we just thank you that we can all be in your house today, that we came to hear something from you. God, I ask you to open our hearts to hear and our ears to listen. Lord, we just thank you for what you're about to, we're about to receive from you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ephesians 1.5 says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. To me, that is amazing that God would want me in his family. A lot of times I hear, you have such an amazing family. And I do. I hear often, you're so close. You're so happy. You're so lucky. And sometimes I hear jealousy or maybe a haunting desire to be part of a big family, something like ours. It always makes me smile and sometimes a little sad because smile because I am happy and blessed to have such a big family. But it makes me sad because there are people who want to be part of a family, but they don't have the closeness with their family. They don't have the numbers of people in their family or their people or their family is like all over the United States and so they're not close by for them to be close with. Or maybe they don't have the joy with their family. Our family has something very special and we share that, but can I be really honest with you today? For our family to have this closeness, we pay a price. Sometimes it's just little prices, which are okay, you know, hearing the same thing over and over and over, whether it's the number of people telling you the same thing or somebody who repeats himself, because we know Wren repeats himself. <laughs> Not us old people, we don't do that. <laughs> Or maybe it's about, I don't want to bring salad again, or I don't want to bring green bean casserole, or I made cheesy potatoes last time. Can't somebody else do that? It's very expensive. <laughs> or how about, I, where am I going to sit? It's Thanksgiving. Everybody has to say what we're thankful for. What am I going to say? Everybody says the same thing. And when we try to squeeze into that little room, there are a lot of people sitting on the hard floor, and we're not getting any younger. <laughs> so it's hard to sit on that hard floor. Amen. <laughs> But you know, there's a higher price that we have to pay. We don't always like to pay it either. It's called compromise and inconvenience. We don't compromise in a family as big as ours. There are arguments, guaranteed. There's anger, sometimes loud, sometimes smoldering. Sometimes it's a slow burn. It's over a long period of time and then blows up. There's also miscommunication. Miscommunication in a family can cause hurt feelings and it can cause friction. Luke eleven seventeen says, he, Jesus, knew their thoughts and he said any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed a family splintered by feuding will fall apart we as a family have to talk things through we have to be open and ask did i hurt your feelings are you mad did i do something i shouldn't have we have to have that open communication if you don't you're going to be splintered but you know what? The highest price for me is spiritual attacks. It attacks a family who loves God. John 10.10 10 says, The thief, who is Satan, his purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose, which is God's, is to give them, or us, a rich and satisfying life. So Satan 
doesn't want us to be a close or harmonious family who prays together. Because you know what? That's power. That's power when we pray together. Let me explain what spiritual attacks means to me. Everyone in my family has experienced something that has shaken them to the core. All of us. From the adults down to the young ones. Something that has stopped us in our tracks when we are just broken and done. I'm only going to talk about Al and I. But I'm sure the other family members, if you would like to hear their stories, I'm sure they would be happy to explain their stories to you. For me, it was a divorce at age 30 with four kids, ages 4 to 14. I mean, 8 to, eight, eight to 14. Sorry. I was married at 16. I didn't have a high school diploma. And all of a sudden, I was a mom, a dad, and I was financially responsible for five people. And I didn't even have a job. I was paralyzed by it all. The what ifs were so big at this time. What if I was prettier? Would he have stayed? What if I was thinner? What if I was a better wife? What if I was a better mom? After a few weeks of just being paralyzed and not being able to move out of my house, my pastor came to my home and he said, get in the car. And he took me to the welfare office. Well, I have to tell you, this was the late 70s and early 80s, and being on welfare back then, was really not a good thing. You were ostracized sometimes. You were made fun of in the grocery line. People talked about you loudly. They didn't care. It was not a good thing. You were shamed. You were looked upon as worthless. I did not have any self-worth at that time. I was embarrassed. But what could I do? I didn't want that for my kids. At that time, I didn't even want to live. But I didn't think there was anyone on this earth who could love my kids the way I did. Their own dad didn't even want them. When your second grader is crying in bed because he's being bullied at school and he has no friends, what do you do? I just got in bed with him and held him and cried with him and said I was sorry. I didn't know what else to do. Back then, bullying was not a thing. People didn't talk about it. Things were different. It's hard to hold on to your faith in situations such as this. My faith was gone. I didn't have any in myself. I didn't have any in God. I didn't have any in anything. But you know what? My family, my church family, and my biological family were praying for me. And God was faithful. Day after day. It didn't look like I wanted it to look. Boy, isn't that the way it works. When God is working, it doesn't look anything like you want. <laughs> and isn't that what dictates our emotions? doesn't look like I'm supposed to do this. It doesn't look like I think it should look. And that dictates how I feel. That's not what God wants. God is faithful. God knows how to use these situations to grow me and my children to be his. Not any of it I could see. Back then, I saw nothing. I cleaned houses to buy my kids clothes. And I'd sell my food stamps to get Christmas money. I even started a tradition in our stockings, a two-pound bag of M&Ms and 40 packs of gum, each individually wrapped. <laughs> because I could buy those with food stamps. That went on for a, quite a while, didn't it? <laughs> God was and is faithful. For Al, it was a different story. 
There was a man at our church who had cancer. He was dying. And Al was convinced that God told him to set up a 24-7, 30-day chart where every hour for 30 days, someone was praying for Bob. <clears throat> and Al did that. He made a chart. He had people sign up. And for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for 30 days, somebody was praying for Bob's healing. 14 day, or 15 days after the chart finished, Al was shaken. He was shaken to the core. I had never seen him like this before. He even asked me, how am I ever going to trust God again? How am I ever going to trust that I hear his voice? How am I ever going to trust to walk in the path he wants me to walk? If I ruined it now. You know, it was almost a year before Al could start trusting again. Because God is faithful. So how do we recover from soul-shaking events that rock our world until we feel broken and torn? Well, we, as a family, started praying together more. I remember when I had three of my young ones in youth group. They were driving by then. And it was at a separate location than where we were. And as they came home, they were walking through the door, and I heard bickering and fighting and arguing. And I thought, they're coming from youth group. What in the heck is going on? So I just took them all and shoved them in a bedroom, closed the door, said, don't come out until you can pray for each other. And I wouldn't let them out. Well, I don't know how that first one went. <laughs> but you know what we found? After a while, you cannot honestly pray for someone effectively and not change your heart about that person. You can't stay angry if you're praying for someone. So if you feel anger for someone, pray. Mm -hmm. Because you know what? Anger can't stay if you are truly praying for a person. Mm -hmm. God is always faithful. How about you? Are you feeling good enough? Maybe you're not pretty enough. Maybe you don't feel loved enough in your family. I think I always had one or two that would say, you don't love me as much as you love the rest. <laughs> Are you worried about your finances? Are you worried about your future? Are you worried about your kids' future? How can I take care of my kids? Oh my goodness, I cut my hair too short. I can't go in public. <laughs> or the color of my hair is orange and it was supposed to be purple. <laughs> That's true, I can tell you. Um, when I was 13, my hair was orange and my mom made me go to school. How about my clothes are too big or my clothes are too small and I have no money to purchase anything else? How about I need a job? How about I need a new job? How about I need a boyfriend or girlfriend? I need a spouse. How about, how am I going to be good enough for what I need to do in my life? Am I doing enough? Am I saving enough? Am I overextending myself because I can't say no? How would that look to everybody if I said no? Wow. Isn't it overwhelming just to live every day? <laughs> but guess what? God is wanting to help you. Matthew 11:28 says, "Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest." And John 14:27 says, "Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled, and do not be afraid." How many times are we afraid? How many times are we worried? God says, you don't need to do that. You can trust me. Sometimes it's overwhelming to be part of a big family. I wouldn't trade it for anything, but it's lots of work. There's lots of personalities that you have to work with. But each of us has some strong characteristics, and I'm really excited to see some, where some of our young ones are going to end up, because God is faithful. 
Do you know that a family doesn't just stay together because they're family? Some of you know this because of your own family. It takes work, a lot of work. And it takes everybody working, not just you. Do you know our church is a family? We need to work together. We have strong points, and then we have some weaker ones. And some of us need to step up, start helping out where we need to. Other of us need to reevaluate where we are and ask God, is this what you want me to do? Or is this what I want to do and you to do it through me? Let me say that again. Is this what you want to do with me, God? Or is this what I want God to do through me? Because those are two different things, not the same. I always wanted to play the piano and sing. We had a, um, two sisters who played the piano at our church. I love to watch them play and sing. It was just like, I'm going to do that. I want to do that. We got an old piano, and I started taking lessons, and God said, no, that is not for you. <laughs> <laughs> that is not where I want you. <laughs> Sometimes we need to stop. Listen, we need to read God's word and stop. You know, sometimes we read God's word and then we say, oh, okay, thanks, good night, you know, or off with my day. But no, we have to stop. We have to listen. We have to praise and worship. But then we have to stop. We have to listen. Is God trying to tell you something through that praise and worship? We have to train ourselves to listen for God's voice. You know, you just don't hear God's voice. And it's hard to listen. Let me just say, my mind tends to wander if I'm trying to be still and quiet. So it's very difficult for me when my mind is wandering to hear God's voice. I have to rein it in. That's my job. I have to focus. I have to listen. I remember a song from back in the day. It was called Set Your Mind. I don't know if anybody remembers it. It says, set your mind, fill it with the word eternal, and get your thoughts in line, and win the battle for your mind. It comes from 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5. We must capture our thoughts. Now, some of you play video games, or you've played um, Risk, things like that, and you capture things. When you capture it, you imprison it. You stop it from doing what it's doing, and you redirect it or put it somewhere where it can't do what it wants to do. That's what we must do with our mind. You must capture your mind, and you must stop it. It's going to wander because that's what Satan wants. He wants you to think about, gosh, I have to do this, I have to do that. I don't want to have dinner and make and all. Don't do that. Capture it. Stop. Say, Lord, help me capture my mind. Show me ways to capture my mind. How do we do that? We think on God's word. We get the Bible. We study. We look up scriptures. You can even get Bible apps that tell you where you can go for certain things. Like if you're feeling sad or if you're feeling depressed. Or, you know, these help you, these apps. I'm constantly asking God to work on me change me, to guide me, to help me to do what he wants me to do with my life. But I have to listen. That's my job, is to listen. Can I tell you that sometimes I get mad because of the way God wants to direct my life? Hmm. Rarely does my plan ever, ever look like God's plan. I can tell you. I have a plan. And I'm going this way. And God's saying, no, we're going this way. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go that way. I want to go this way. So that's when you have to capture. Hey, redirect. Where do you want me to go, God? And if you're really being obedient, if you're really listening, this is the way you have to go. What about you? Do you have a strong family? Do you enjoy a big family? Or do you just like a quiet few? You know, some people just like a quiet few. I remember when some of our in-laws came into the family. 
They were not as quite overjoyed with us. Can you imagine that? <laughs> we were overwhelming to them. <laughs> Our church is a big family. And it's not just this family. It's the whole family of God. Church is a family. Do you enjoy a big family? A lot of people like big churches. I think sometimes they just want to get lost. Some people like small families where everyone is kind of uh, friends and, and you can uh, enjoy one another, things like that. There's no right or wrong in being in a church family. Sometimes we can have just a quiet few in any church family that you're comfortable with in talking to regularly, telling them your problems, knowing they're going to keep that between you, praying together, enjoying the things of life together, talking about each other's families together, finding out what's going on in their families, checking up on them, making sure that everything's okay, finding time to care about the things that they care about. Or maybe you like a big family, like all of us, and you don't have a problem sharing a problem with the whole church family. So I need prayer. I need help. Ephesians 2.19 says, So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with God's holy people. You are members of God's family. But remember, there's always a price to pay, even in a church family. 1 John 3.9 says, Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning, because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So one of the prices you pay is not sinning, becoming more like Christ every day. That means you need to read God's word to find out how Christ lives so that you can be more like him. Another one is giving of your time. Time is very precious to all of us until you're retired and you have too much. <laughs> but I mean, when you're working and you're doing other things, you don't have a lot of time. But you need to make sure that you're listening to God and doing what he wants you to do with your time. Another thing that we have to give of is our money. Such a subject. We need to give our time. You know, people don't really like to talk about tithe. A tithe is 10% of what you bring in. It's very important in a family to help with the resources, and that's what tithing is. And our offerings are very important. And maybe that's offering to do something else of your, of your time or something like that. It's an important part of our family. It takes care of our church needs. Remember 2 Corinthians 2, 9, or 9, 7 says, God loves a cheerful giver. And Matthew 3, or Malachi 3, verse 8, just paraphrase, it tells us we cheat God by not paying our tithe and offerings. And verse 10 says, bring all of our tithe into the storehouse or the church so there's enough. Enough, enough of what? Enough money to keep our church running. You know, back in the Bible days, they brought food because that's how the priests ate. They didn't eat if people didn't bring their tithe. This church can't run if people don't pay tithe because we can't pay the bills. We can't pay to rent the church or, or the building or the lights or for the heat or for the air conditioning. Those things have to be paid for, and we as a church need to make sure that we are giving what God wants us to give, our 10% at least. We have to give of all of our resources, things that you have. <coughs> Maybe you have an extra coat. You know someone who needs a coat. You could give that. You need to give space in your life. You know, sometimes we need to invite people into our lives. And that's hard, especially if it's 
a person that you feel like you would never get along with. But we need to make sure that we have that space in our life. And sometimes we have sleepless nights of prayer for people in our church family. There's also heartbreak. I remember when Mike was in youth group, there was a boy named Brian Shackelford. Moved back to Tennessee with his family, and he was 16. He was killed in a car accident. Heartbreak. When you're in a church family, there's heartbreak sometimes. That was tough for the whole youth group. And sometimes there's tears of joy or sorrow. How would you feel if your family rejected you if you gave your life for Christ? That happens. That really happens. But remember, God is always faithful. Now I'd like for you to just to listen really quick to a song by Mercy Me called Even If. Even if, even if things start to go wrong, even if it doesn't look like you think it should look, God is faithful. I believe as people who love God, we need to commit to being part of a church family. If you don't belong to one, this is a great church family to belong to. Hebrews 10.25 said, let's not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And Luke 14, 28, don't begin the cost, to count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if, it's enough, if you have enough to finish it? My family is pretty great. This church family is awesome. To some, they're even closer to this church family than their own family. Also, one thing we need to remember, there are rewards for being in a family. You have prayer partners. You have friends. You have encouragers. You have people who care about each other's lives and what's happening in them. We celebrate things. We have joy and we have peace. And there's always somebody to talk to. If you need somebody to talk to, call me up. I'll talk day or night. I just want to leave you today with a couple of questions. Are you ready to be part of a family? Are you willing to reevaluate your part in your church family? Are you sure you're in the place God has for you? And are you doing enough? Let's pray. Are you enjoying Journey Life Church's videos? Consider donating today via the Givelify app on the Google Play and Apple App Store.